something wrong with the mic, okay? Let me double check. Is this, guy, is this working now? Can you hear me? Yeah? Should be working. Can you guys confirm that the sound is working fine? Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right, so um, this is our last AS workshop, actually, because today we are going to finish uh, the microeconomic part of, of the syllabus. Uh, and I will not uh, schedule uh, additional workshops for macroeconomics, at least not for now, maybe later. Um, but this is not uh, uh, something that uh, I can uh, continue to do for now. Uh, thank you, Naz. Uh, simply because it's just too much <laughs> for me at the moment uh, to have uh, uh, two workshops per, uh, per week. Uh, plus uh, my work uh, at the school, plus uh, um, you know maintaining the websites, plus time with uh, uh, the family and and, and everything, and, and it's just uh, a bit too much. It's um, more uh, labor intensive than I realize. Um, so I, so I, I need a, a short break <laughs> to take a break so I can uh, uh, yeah have a, a bit more time for myself, family, and all. Um, um, it's likely that I will uh, schedule uh, the, the macro workshops uh, later, but probably not on a regular basis. Probably not like uh, uh, every week, every Tuesday, every Wednesday. Uh, I just, uh, you know, especially because I want to uh, have enough time to, uh, to, to update uh, the PPTs or to create new PPTs. Uh, the summaries, and I, I don't want to rush it. I want to, uh, to uh, create documents of the highest possible quality. And at the moment, this just uh, takes too much of my time. Okay, so there will probably in a few months be um, additional workshops that should cover uh, part or the entire macroeconomic uh, syllabus. But uh, I cannot yet tell you when this is going to be. Uh, and this is most likely not going to be something that will take place every week. But of course, you are a part of the WeChat group. Uh, so um, I will share information about that as soon as I start uh, scheduling additional workshops. OK. Uh, so, yeah, today, the, today should actually be uh, I, I know I say that every week and it, it always ends up being a long workshop, but <laughs> today it should really be uh, relatively short uh, because we have to cover only uh, two pretty short topics. We need to talk about price control, which, which is uh, one way in which uh, governments can uh, influence what happens within specific uh, markets. Um, we'll see why, we'll see how it works, we'll see what are the, the main uh, uh, motives for price control and what are the main limitations. And then we... Um, need to have a look at what I simply called other policy instruments, okay? Because we talked about taxes and subsidies in detail. Uh, we will talk about price control in detail. And then there are essentially three additional policy instruments that we need to, uh, to analyze, but it's more brief, okay? We need to have a look at the benefits, uh, how we can use the benefits, uh, like universal and means-tested benefit. And we also need to have a look at government provision. And to, we need to have a look at nationalization and privatization. Okay, I, I put it together because it's the same process. It's going to go uh, from A to B or from B to A, but overall it's a, a very similar process. Okay, so that's why I put it, uh, I put it together. All right, so you should already have most of the documents uh, on the website. Let me just... Uh, Share my screen so you guys can uh, check. Uh, I think the last, the, the there is one last document that I have not yet um, uh, uploaded, which is the summary of other policy instruments. I, I am about to, uh, to 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 finish it, but if you go to resources, we should have pretty much everything. Uh, where is it? 
Yeah, so you have everything about price control. Yeah, everything is there, no problem. And uh, other policy instruments, you have everything apart from yeah, the summary. So the summary, I will add it later tonight or perhaps tomorrow. Uh, but apart from that, all uh, everything has been uh, uploaded uh, today. Okay. All right. Let's go. Let's let's uh, let's start with uh, maximum and minimum prices. Price control. Actually, we could just uh, call it price control here. Let me just uh, price control. That's more concise, right? Concision is always um, a good quality. Let's go. Price control. So what is it? Uh, generally speaking, it's it's a legal restriction that is in, in imposed by the government on how high or how low a market price can be. Okay, it just tell okay this price is okay, this price is uh, is acceptable, uh, it's legal. Uh, this one is not. Okay, it's just as simple as that. And yes, there are two major type of restrictions. You can limit. Uh, a, a price in the sense that you can prevent the price from becoming too high. And in this case, uh, the government will impose a, a maximum price or a price ceiling. Okay, so this is the maximum price that sellers are allowed uh, to charge. Essentially, it's not okay. Because of course, sellers, what do they want? They want to charge the highest possible price. Okay, it's never a problem from the demand side. Okay, buyers will never want to offer the highest uh, possible price. It's, uh, it's really about sellers, they are not allowed to charge more than a certain uh, level. Okay. There are examples, uh, real life examples could be uh, for rent control. There are many uh, cities in the world that have imposed rent control uh, in order to make sure that uh, everybody can, um, everybody who wishes to work within the city uh, can afford uh, decent uh, housing. Uh, two famous examples would be Paris and New York. These are two cities that have implemented rent control. Uh, could be utilities, especially right now. Uh, you know that the, the price of uh, gas is uh, skyrocketing at the moment. Let, let's just have a look at the price. I don't know if you follow a bit what, uh, what happens with the price of gas. I don't have my VPN on, so let's see if I can uh, uh, if we can see the the trend. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, no, that's not uh, that. No, that's price natural gas. Will I be able to find this? Uh, no, I, I I'm I'm sorry. I I was hoping I could find the data, but essentially, yeah, the natural gas becomes very very expensive. If I had my VPN on, it would be easy easy to uh, uh, find it. But yeah, there are articles, and you could actually it's very it would be very interesting. Yeah, why natural gas stocks have nearly doubled this year? So, yeah, you see, uh, that's the price of natural gas. So. There are very, very uh, important increase in the price of gases. And in many countries, again, including France, um, I often use the example of France, but this is what I know best. <laughs> uh, France has imposed a, a maximum price on uh, uh, gas and electricity. And just to make sure that everybody, because it's a necessity, okay, just like housing, this is a necessity. And that's one reason for which we impose price ceilings. We, we want to make sure that everybody, even those who are on a modest income, so low income, that they are able to afford those basic necessities, uh, utilities. And also there are some um, countries that impose the maximum prices on what we call a, a staple food stuff. So like basic, uh, uh, basic uh, food, okay, like bread, rice, cooking oil, uh, again, because uh, and it's actually it could, could be the consequence of a poor harvest. If there are very poor harvests in one particular year, especially in developing countries, uh, that's a sort of very low supply. supply. Uh, it's possible that the price of those uh, basic necessities, the price of these basic food stuff, might uh, increase a, a lot, and uh, which would have a dramatic uh, consequence on. Uh, the standard, uh, the living standards of the population, especially those on low incomes. So in order to prevent that, the government can impose a, a price ceiling, a maximum price to make sure that everybody can maintain uh, basic uh, quality of life, basic living standards, yes. And then we have the uh, opposite uh, restriction, the price floor, 
which is essentially the minimum price that buyers have to pay to buy something. Because of course, buyers, what do they want? They want to uh, pay the lowest possible price for a given good or service, okay? But sometimes uh, the government will uh, just uh, force, essentially, buyers to pay at least a certain amount, okay? And if they want to offer less than this required minimum amount, then this would be illegal. And the best example is the minimum wage, all right? The minimum wage, that's the minimum price that businesses must pay to workers in order to purchase their workforce. Uh, could be also for agricultural commodities. Uh, there are some situations in which uh, the price of some commodities is so low that farmers, they cannot receive enough income. Typical example could be milk. Yeah, it's, it's often the case that there is uh, too much, uh, that the, the production of milk is uh, just too important, which leads to a very low price of milk. And because of that, farmers, they uh, cannot just uh, generate enough income. So in order to protect their purchasing power and make sure that, again, those farmers, they can, uh, so those sellers can uh, generate enough income to have uh, an acceptable uh, quality of life, then the government can uh, support the price of milk by imposing a minimum price. Or could be a demerit good, yeah, because again, in that case, um, if, if alcohol is uh, too uh, cheap, if cigarettes are too cheap, then the government might be afraid that uh, people will drink too much alcohol, that they will smoke too much, and that can cause some serious public health uh, issues. So one way to discourage the consumption of those uh, demerit goods is to set a minimum price that is uh, higher than the market equilibrium price. So something interesting that we see is that those uh, two last reasons, like uh, the minimum price for agricultural commodities and the uh, minimum price for demerit goods, uh, in that case, the, the minimum price has the same effect, but for different reasons, right? Uh, in introducing a minimum price uh, on agricultural commodities, it's mostly about equity. It's mostly about fairness. Okay. It's not really a market failure. It's just that, hey, uh, those farmers, they have uh, such a low income. We need to help them. So it's really about fairness. Uh, in, imposing um, a minimum price on demerit goods, it's not about fairness. It's about efficiency because we know that demerit goods lead to market failures. It, so it is by uh, raising the price that you can address this overprovision. Uh, so you see that the reasons for which we introduce a, a minimum price uh, are different in that case. Okay. Of course, if you want uh, price control to be uh, effective and to actually change something within a market, then you need to set it at the right level. And in particular, if you set a maximum price, uh, of course, the maximum price should be below the equilibrium price. Okay, If the equilibrium price is 10 and you set a maximum price at 12, oh, nothing is going to happen. right? Uh, this uh, price ceiling will have zero consequences in the market. It will be completely ineffective. Uh, however, if you uh, set a maximum price below the market equilibrium price, then it's going to be effective. It's going to be active, uh, if you want, uh, and it's going to modify the equilibrium quantity, which is going to be traded in this market. Maybe not equilibrium quantity, because you know that if we have, if you introduce a, an effective price ceiling, you no longer have a market equilibrium. Okay, but you have a certain quantity that is going to be traded. This we will discuss. It. Uh, all right. And of course, we'll see that on, on, the, on the diagram. If you set a maximum price below the equilibrium price, then uh, at the maximum price, the quantity demanded <clears throat> will exceed uh, the quantity uh, supplied. So we will have a shortage or excess demand. Uh, and uh, it is going to be persistent. Uh, what, uh, what do I mean by persistent? Um, <clears throat> if, you, if you don't have any government intervention, uh, it's possible that in a market with no government intervention, it's possible that you have shortages. It's possible that you have uh, surpluses. Uh, for example, if you take a market and you assume that it is initially in equilibrium, okay? And if there is an increase in demand, so the equilibrium price will eventually uh, rise, okay? But at first, uh, the, it takes time, right? It takes time for the price to rise and to eventually reach the new equilibrium, its new equilibrium position. So at first, at the initial uh, equilibrium price, an increase in demand will first lead to a shortage, but it's not going to be persistent because there is no uh, restriction on how high or how low the price can go. 
So as soon as you have the shorted in an unrestricted uh, market, the free market, then the price will go up. Okay, so the shortage will be temporary. But if you have a, a price ceiling, an effective price ceiling, the shortage will just uh, stay. Okay, it's not going to be absorbed by a higher price because the price cannot go any higher. So that's why I wrote that the shortage will be persistent. We will uh, be stuck with the shortage, essentially. All right. And yes, if the price ceiling is above, no consequence. And same thing, well, it's actually the opposite when we look at the price floor. Uh, if you want your price floor to be effective, uh, it should be above the market equilibrium price. Okay, if uh, the equilibrium price is 10 and you say, oh, I have a great idea. Uh, I'm going to set a minimum price at $8. Okay, <laughs> the equilibrium price will still be eight, uh, $10. Okay, so nothing is going to happen. Uh, and unlike a maximum price that leads to a persistent shortage, a price floor leads to a persistent surplus, okay? Because the, 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 the price will remain uh, above its equilibrium position and therefore the quantity supplied will exceed the quantity demanded. And again, in a free market, in that case, the price would eventually go down and this would absorb this surplus and this would until we reach the market clearing price. But in our case, uh, this can't happen uh, because uh, the price cannot go below the minimum price. Okay, quite simple. That's how you can represent it uh, graphically. So I like to use, um, it's not a very common notation, but I like to use upper bar, P upper bar for price ceiling. Okay, it's like if this bar is the ceiling, it's the maximum price above P. So the price has to be below this level. It's easy to remember, right? So in that case, it's a price ceiling and it is below P star. So P star is the market equilibrium price, okay? Uh, and you see, I have identified two areas. One is uh, this red area and one is this green area. Uh, so basically the green area uh, represent the prices that are acceptable. By acceptable, I mean legal. Okay, it is illegal to charge a price above the uh, above the price ceiling. So that's why this uh, red area represents the prices that are not possible. So clearly here, the uh, maximum price is effective because it is set below the equilibrium price, and therefore this will create a shortage, excess demand. The quantity demanded is larger than the quantity supplied. So this represents a price ceiling that is effective. Something that students uh, must uh, understand because that's going to be very important when we uh, analyze how price control can be used to uh, solve uh, market failures. And when we want to understand what are the consequences of price control in terms of uh, economic efficiency, what they should understand, or you can ask uh, them this question is, all right, so now when, once we introduce this, this, price, this maximum price, because initially with no uh, price control, the price is P star and the quantity is Q star, okay? So how much uh, output is going to be produced and uh, consumed with no pr price control? Q star, no problem. But then once we introduce this uh, price ceiling, once we introduce this uh, maximum price, how many units are going to be produced and consumed? It's a good question. Is this going to be QS? Is it going to be a Q star? Is it going to be QD? Well, when you think about it, at P upper bar, firms want to sell QS. Buyers want to buy QD. Okay, But of course, businesses, they are not going to produce QD. They are only going to produce QS. And therefore, buyers are not able to buy more than what is available. Okay, only QS is available. Firms, they only produce QS. So at the end of the day, how many units are going to be traded in this market? Only QS, okay? Not Q star, not QD, because only QS is going to be produced. So what is the new? So I don't really want to call that the equilibrium quantity because you see that P upper bar is not an equilibrium price. So what you can say is how many units will effectively be traded in the market? 
So you don't use the key word term equilibrium. How many units will be effectively traded in the market after we introduce this maximum price? QS, simply because it's not possible to buy more than what is available. This is a second example uh, of a price ceiling again, but here the price ceiling uh, is ineffective because it is set above the equilibrium price. And therefore, well, the equilibrium price is still P star. This does not change anything. So it does not create a shortage. It's simple, but just mention it. It's always good to see all possible cases. And then we have price floors. Okay, so in this case, the price floor, so you see a price floor is uh, represented by the lower bar. And sorry, I see that there is a, a tiny glitch here. Did you notice? There is a white part. Okay, uh -huh. that's better. You see that, uh, so P lower bar is the minimum price. And again, the lower bar means that it's the floor. The price is above the floor, easy. The same thing, the green area is uh, represents the, uh, the price range that is acceptable, the price range that is legal, and uh, the red area represents the price range that is too low, that is unacceptable, that is illegal. So here, clearly, the price floor is set above the equilibrium price, and therefore, it is effective. Uh, because it is effective, uh, it's going to create a surplus. You see that at P lower bar, the quantity supplied is larger than the quantity demanded. So there is excess supply, surplus. Okay, and it is effective. Same thing, same question. How many units are effectively going to be uh, traded in this market after the price floor is introduced? Okay, so same question. At that price, buyers, they only want to buy QD and sellers, they want to buy QS. Okay, so of course, Sellers, they will not be able to sell more than what buyers want to buy, of course. So again, how many units will be effectively traded in that market after the introduction of the price floor? QD. Okay, I repeat the explanation because sellers cannot sell more units than what buyers are willing and able to buy. So there is something that is very interesting. And in some textbooks, there is a pretty big mistake. Uh, uh, so make sure you make it clear to your students. It doesn't matter whether you introduce a price floor or whether you introduce a price ceiling. As long as they are effective, they will lead to a decrease in the quantity traded in the market. OK, it's very clear. Look at the price, uh, look at the price ceiling, OK? The effective price ceiling. Initially, we traded Q star. Now we only trade QS. So the price ceiling leads to a decrease in the quantity that is traded, even if the price is lower. So yes, people want to buy more, sure. But because firms are now willing to sell less, overall, the quantity traded will fall okay, from Q star to QS. And that's the same thing when you introduce a price floor, the quantity traded falls from Q star to QD. The bottom line is that price control can not uh, increase the quantity traded in the perfectly competitive market. I repeat, price control, price floor, and price ceiling, as long as they are effective, they will never increase the quantity traded in the market. It will always lead to a fall in the quantity traded in the market. I mentioned perfectly competitive market because if you are in other market structures, this might not be the case. For example, if you uh, teach A2, you know that in a monopsonistic labor market, if you introduce a minimum wage, for example, yeah, uh, this might actually increase the equilibrium level of employment. Okay, But in perfect competition and just supply and demand, that's not going to be the case. Which means that when you look at market failures, you can only solve one type of market failure with price control. You can only uh, correct a market failure in which the market uh, over provides the good or service, allocates too many resources to the production of the good or service. So demerit goods, for example, negative externalities, yes, but you will never be able to use uh, a price floor or a price ceiling 
to increase the consumption of married goods or to encourage the production of uh, positive externalities, for example. And I see some books that say uh, something like, if you have a demerit good, you should introduce a price floor. And if you have a married good, you should introduce a price uh, ceiling. But that's definitely not the case. In both cases, this would lead to a decrease in production. So make sure that your students don't make that, uh, that mistake. Okay. And here, last diagram shows a price floor that is ineffective. It is ineffective because it is set below the equilibrium price. Okay, questions? Are we good so far? All good? All right, so why do governments do that? Why do they introduce price control? As I just mentioned, this can be one way to uh, solve market failures, but only those in which there is an over-provision. So for AS, that means demerit goods. That's it, because uh, in A2, we will also talk about negative externalities, but that's not part of the uh, AS syllabus. So I know that sometimes AS textbooks, they talk about negative externalities, but if you look at the, the, the Cambridge syllabus, it should be part of A2. Okay, so um, I think it's uh, enough to focus on demerit. Yes, because we saw on the diagram that as soon as you introduce an effective price uh, ceiling or price floor, the quantity traded decreases. Okay, that's one reason. So it's about efficiency. In that case, could be for fairness purposes, and I already started to illustrate that. Uh, could be a situation where we introduce a price floor because we want to support the income of some sellers, okay, like farmers or milk. The, the equilibrium price of milk is too low. Uh, uh, milk farmers they don't have they they can't uh, make enough uh, or generate enough income, earn enough income, uh, so the government will introduce a price floor to support their income. Or even in the labor market, okay, same thing. We set a minimum wage uh, to make sure that all those who work can, uh, uh, well, basically afford the basic, uh, or meet their basic needs, okay. And uh, price ceilings, we can implement them again uh, to preserve the purchasing power of some buyers, okay, like rent control. Uh, we, the government might consider that, hey, it's not fair to pay uh, 2,000 euros for a two-bedroom apartment in Paris. Uh, if, you have, uh, if you are married and you have two kids, uh, can you imagine if you have to pay 2,000 euros per... Um, per uh, just hold on, I have... Uh, da, 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 my battery is running low. Just give me a sec. I'm just uh, plugging my uh, oh. laptop. Just a sec. Okay, sorry, I forgot to plug it before the before the meeting. Yeah, I was saying that uh, governments they might just consider that no, that's just not uh, fair uh, to to charge rents that are excessively high, and that would essentially uh, put a very heavy financial pressure on the families who want to live within some cities. Uh, so that's also one reason for which price ceilings can exist. Same thing for basic necessities. Yeah, you should not have to spend. Uh, 20% of your uh, income uh, to pay uh, electricity, for example, uh, or to pay uh, gas, uh, so or to buy bread, of course. Um, you know that there are, uh, right now, I don't know if you follow the situation in uh, Lebanon. Uh, in Lebanon, uh, there is, uh, well, the economic situation is, uh, is actually uh, very, very serious. And right now, there was, uh, there was an article that I read a few days back that uh, I, I forgot the exact title, but this is something like, how many uh, hours do you have to work to afford uh, a loaf of bread? And if I remember well, to afford a loaf of bread 
in Lebanon right now at minimum wage, you had to work uh, 37 hours. That was something as ridiculous as that. So like one week of income just to buy one loaf of bread. This was completely crazy. Um, so yeah, that's also uh, one reason. You, you, can, you can Google it because of, I'm not exactly sure about the numbers and maybe I, 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 I am mistaken, but this was ridiculous. Uh, actually, okay, let, let, let's do it together. But I, I don't know if uh, with the uh, if without the the, the VPN, uh, I will be able to uh, to find it. So I'm in Lebanon. How many? Let's see if I can work to to buy. Was it this article? Uh, but I don't know if without the VPN. All right. How many hours do you have to work? Every to afford everyday items in, in Lebanon. Uh, da, 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 da. For example, people who work 40 hours a week at a monthly minimum wage da, 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 must work one hour to buy a lot. Oh, no, sorry, I, see, I, I exaggerated. I exaggerated. Or oh, maybe I was meat. One, oh, yeah, yeah, that was meat. That was not bread, sorry. A kilogram of ground beef would require 23 hours <laughs> and 42 minutes of labor. <laughs> well, I'm laughing. It's not funny. Of course, that's just ridiculous. That's just completely ridiculous to have to work four hours, the equivalent of four hours, just to buy one kilogram of meat, right? Uh, so that's uh, actually, uh, yeah, the situation is quite uh, dramatic in, in Lebanon at the moment. And that's something that is quite interesting. Uh, uh, could be a nice topic for your students to uh, to make a, a presentation to try to understand the the, the situation in uh, in Lebanon uh, at the moment. All right, so yes, in, in, in those cases, the government might want to uh, set say a, a maximum price on uh, beef uh, to protect buyers, but of course, this would create a shortage of beef. So that's also something that you have to consider. Yeah, beef will be cheaper. But you might have a lot of people who, can seem to, who can't find beef because sellers, they don't want to sell beef at uh, the lower price. But the point is that, yes, sometimes a uh, price control uh, can be used, especially price ceiling, to protect the purchasing power of buyers. Okay. However, there are some limitations. And uh, I focus on just two limitations. Uh, if you want to go a bit further, there is uh, two more slides where I discuss further limitations of price control, but they are a bit more advanced. And I realized through the years that most students, they are a bit confused about that. They don't, and uh, in essay questions, when they try to explain it, it's, it's not so clear. So that's why I've decided to, um, to add the one step further star. And I usually don't introduce it in class. Uh, so yes, inefficiently low uh, or high quality, inefficient allocation of purchases or sales among buyers or sellers, and under allocation of resources. That's a bit advanced for AS. So usually I just focus on two main ideas, uh, wasted resources and black markets, which are two obvious uh, problems with, uh, with price control. So as I uh, mentioned, uh, an effective price ceiling or an effective price floor will always lead to either a shortage or a surplus. Uh, and in both situations, resources might be wasted uh, because buyers or sellers, they have to use resources to cope with the shortage or the surplus. Okay, example, let's say that there is a price ceiling. Okay, effective. So there will be a shortage. Let's say that this is beef because we just read the article about, uh, about beef. Uh, so there is a massive shortage of beef. Okay, and so we are in Lebanon uh, and the, the butcher shop uh, opens at uh, 8 a.m. All right, and we basically we know that there will not be enough beef for everyone. <laughs> okay, maybe there are only, uh, I don't know, uh, 100 kilograms of beef available and they are... Uh, uh, the demand that that price would be 500 kilograms. Well, in that case, what uh, is uh, the incentive of buyers? Well, they have an incentive to go there as early as possible, to be uh, the first in line, 
And when the butcher shop opens, well, they can uh, actually, they are, uh, they are, there is still some beef available. Okay, and uh, it might actually work. But why is this a problem? Because you waste your time, essentially. <laughs> uh, you use, you allocate a resource, your time that could be used for something else. Okay, so there is an opportunity cost. You could use this time to do something more productive. Uh, but because of this shortage, uh, because, uh, the, because you know that uh, there is not enough for everyone, uh, you have to allocate some of your time to make sure that you can get the product. Okay, so this is a resource that could have been used uh, in an, uh, otherwise uh, if there was no shortage in that market. So if there was no uh, price uh, ceiling in that market. And it's actually the same situation when there is a price floor. But now it's not the buyers who waste resources. These are the sellers because when you have a price floor, an effective price floor, uh, this leads to a surplus, okay? Meaning that they are essentially uh, more uh, sellers than buyers, okay? So in that case, uh, the reason for which resources might be wasted is because the sellers, they might have to allocate the time and other productive resources to find a buyer and the easiest example the best example to illustrate that is on the labor market because there are often uh, surpluses in the labor market due to uh, minimum wages uh, which means that at the minimum wages there are more people who want to work than businesses who want to offer uh, jobs and therefore people who uh, want to work they will uh, spend a lot of time and uh, effort to find a job, okay, it can take weeks, it can take months, you would have to spend a lot of time applying for jobs, uh, writing uh, cover letters, updating your resume, sending application, going to job interviews, and so on. It can be a very long process during, and you might have to allocate so many resources uh, to uh, eventually find a job. And as you can imagine, the, the more the, the larger the surplus so the more competitive it is going to be for sellers the more difficult it is going to be for sellers to find a job in the labor market uh, the more likely it is that they will have to allocate many resources to uh, eventually find a job right and of course if there were no uh, if there were no uh, surplus in the labor market you would not have that situation because at the equilibrium price the quantity supplied is exactly equal to the quantity demanded so all those who are able and willing to sell their workforce at the market price, they find a job. So that's one, that's one problem. Resources, there will be some resources being wasted as the result of the introduction of that price control. Uh, and the second uh, limitation, and that's actually the, 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 the student's favorite, as soon as you ask them, okay, what are some problems with price control? Boom, I don't know if it's the same for you guys, but with my students, Every time they just tell me black markets, black markets, they, they, they seem to enjoy that very much, uh, which is true. It, it, it is a problem because whenever there is a shortage, whenever there is a surplus, uh, there might be some uh, illegal agreements between buyers and sellers, could be some uh, backhanders. Uh, in, in the case of a, a shortage, for example, you know that there are not enough uh, products for all those who want to buy it. So you might uh, uh, choose to uh, offer uh, a, a price above the price ceiling in order to find a seller willing to sell to you. So for example, if the price is, uh, the maximum price for bread is let's say uh, $2 for one loaf of, of bread, uh, you might uh, offer a, a higher price even if it's illegal because well, you are, it's illegal to offer a price above uh, the, uh, the, the price ceiling, but you might, have an incentive to offer a higher price in order to uh, get the product, to convince the seller to sell to you and not to the other potential buyers, okay? And same thing if you have a price floor, so this creates a surplus. If we go back to the example of the, uh, of, uh, the labor market, you might have a situation where people who really want a job, they might uh, accept a wage that is lower than the minimum wage. It exists in many countries, you have that situation. So of course, it is illegal, so it is undeclared. So those people, they usually work uh, without uh, a contract. Uh, they are often paid in cash. Uh, and so they just agree, yes, uh, they accept less than minimum wage, but at least they have a job. Uh, so, and this is the direct consequence of the introduction of this uh, price floor, right? So this can happen 
the existence of persistent shortages and surpluses encourages buyers and sellers to uh, enter into illegal agreements. Okay. And that's it. You see, I told you it was going to be short. At least we are done with the first topic. Okay, any questions or remark or anything about price control? Price control, anything at all? So let me show you what we have. Uh, so what do we have? Um, yeah, so only three definitions here. Um, the def the summary is only one page, and the concept. Uh, no, not this one. Sorry, where is it? Uh, okay, I may have made a mistake. I may have made a mistake. Hmm. I may have deleted my con my concept card. Yes. I think so. Maybe it's still here. If I haven't, so was I stupid or not? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the last document. That's the. Uh... Da -da -da -da. Is it here? Otherwise, I will just uh, upload it. Yes, it's here. Okay. <laughs> so this is these are the the, the, the concept cards for uh, price control. All right. So it's about it for for price control. Any questions? All make sense. Okay, great. Right. So uh, we are now ready to look at the last document uh, that I entitled "Other Policy Instruments." Let's just take uh, two minutes, okay, to uh, get some water. Uh, relax two minutes and then I will start uh, talking about uh, uh, yes other policy instruments that should not take too long. Just, let's just take a two minute break. All right. So as I said um, earlier, there are these uh, PPTs actually uh, organized into three main sections. First, we'll talk about benefits. Uh, second, we'll look at the government provision of goods and services. And finally, uh, nationalization and privatization. OK, so these are the three main uh, other policy instruments that uh, AS students should know. And actually benefits, this is, um, uh, it's, it's, I, I, I feel like it's, it's part of both AS and A2 because in A2, we also talk about benefits, right? In the, in the third chapter, government microeconomic intervention, we also talk about the poverty trap, for example. 
Uh, we also talk about like uh, negative income tax, which uh, relates to benefits. So I'm not really happy with the way uh, this uh, the benefits uh, transfer payments are a bit uh, over AS and A2. I, I think this doesn't make much sense, but yes, in AS students should know uh, uh, about transfer payments, different types of benefits, how they work and so on. So let's get started. Okay. Um, yeah, I like this uh, picture because you know that a transfer payment is a one-way payment, okay? Uh, usually, uh, when you, if you give money to someone, most of the time, this is because you receive something in return, okay? You go to the restaurant, you give money because you receive a, a meal, uh, or you... Uh, uh, every month I receive uh, my salary because I uh, give a service to my school, okay? Uh, so for uh, the vast majority of economic transactions, uh, you have uh, essentially two sides in any economic transaction. There is uh, uh, two flows uh, that, go, that, have, uh, that go in the opposite direction, but have the same value, okay? Uh, and that's why, uh, for example, when we study the balance of payments, that's why we uh, that's we have a, we use the system of double entry bookkeeping, and that's why the balance of payment will always balance. Okay, that's because of that. But there is an exception, which is the transfer payment. So the benefit, because the benefit or transfer payment is something that the government, usually the government, gives to uh, someone could be a. Uh, usually, when we talk about the benefit, we talk about uh, to give to households, not to businesses. We can give subsidies to uh, businesses, but when we talk about benefits, we are not talking about uh, subsidies. Uh, so the government gives uh, often money to some households, and the households, they don't have to um, give anything in return. Okay, it's a one-way payment. So uh, you could actually uh, regard, uh, we often say that benefits are given by the government, and it's true, uh, but you could also consider that uh, when uh, your parents uh, or uh, make uh, give you some hongbao, uh, for example, when your parents give you some cash or, or when you give some cash to, uh, to, to, to someone, we would not call that a benefit, but we can call it a transfer payment. Okay, when you just give money to someone, and if there is nothing in return but uh, gratitude, <laughs> this would be uh, a transfer payment. Okay, but the keyword benefit uh, usually refers to the government uh, giving usually money to some households, and we'll see which one. Yeah. All right, uh, and there are actually two types of benefits, but we mostly focus on the first one. We can that we can call in cash benefits, or that's what we call transfer payments. Uh, so it's a one-way payment yeah, that is made to a person or organization, uh, even though that's mostly uh, households rather than organization, without goods or services being received in return. Okay, so you just receive money, mostly often for the government. But you also have uh, other types of uh, benefits that we call in-kind benefit, which... Uh, is a situation when you receive a, a good or service directly, okay? You don't receive a cash, you receive a good or service often from the government. And again, you don't have to pay for it. You don't have to give anything in return. So these are the two main types of benefits. And who receives those benefits? It depends, okay? But often these are vulnerable groups, basically people who need assistance, people who need to be supported, could be uh, the elderly because they are retired and they have a lower income. So uh, you need to support them. Could be those who are disabled because they can't work. Uh, this might be those who are unemployed because again, they, are, uh, they might uh, not be able to uh, meet their basic needs. Could be the very poor because for the same reason. So often uh, those benefits are directed towards those who are considered to be vulnerable. Right, Why? what is the main objective? Uh, I mentioned it, uh, usually the objective is to ensure a basic living standard for all. Okay, that's often the reason for which governments give benefit. Uh, to and that's one way you can reduce income inequality and to reduce poverty. 
so you know that there are different types of poverty. It could be absolute poverty, relative poverty, but here it doesn't really matter. Uh, we can reduce poverty. Right? We are mostly talking about relative poverty. Yes. Uh, and when you think about it, uh, why, why does it reduce inequality? Because uh, benefits, they are part of government spending. Okay, so this is spending by the government that goes often towards those uh, on low incomes, those who can't work, for example, uh, who need assistance. But this uh, government spending is uh, financed by taxes, right? Tax, mostly tax revenue. The government collects tax revenue and then use it, it uses its tax revenue to give benefits. And who pays? Uh, most of the tax revenue, well, those who pay, uh, those who earn a high income, so they pay a lot of direct taxes, uh, and those who spend a lot, they pay a lot of indirect taxes. So when you think about it, if you, uh, if you have a high income, you pay a lot of taxes and you don't receive benefits. Uh, so, okay, so you, so you don't really, uh, you pay and you don't benefit from it. But if you are, let's say, unemployed or if you have very low income, you don't pay a lot of taxes and you receive benefits. OK, so that's why uh, benefits through the tax system and uh, this uh, provision or this uh, the distribution of benefits by the government is one way to uh, essentially uh, redistribute income from high income earners to low income earners. So it reduces inequality. And there are two main categories of benefits universal benefits and means tested benefits. So universal means uh, for everyone, regardless of your income or wealth, okay? So it doesn't matter if you are a billionaire, <laughs> you can receive it given that you meet a certain criterion, could be uh, simply something like your age. You, if you belong to a certain, uh, age uh, range, like, let's say over 65, uh, you might uh, be able to receive a benefit from uh, the government. Okay, so uh, what's good about that is, what's good is that it's easy to put in place. If the only thing that you need to do is to look at uh, how old people are and if they are old enough, for example, you give them the money, otherwise you don't, it's very simple. So the, uh, the transaction costs would actually be very, very low, simple, and it's an advantage. But of course, the main problem is that uh, if, if you don't really look at uh, whether the recipients are rich or poor, uh, you might provide money to people who do not need it, okay? A typical example in France, for example, uh, is the child benefit. So in France, if you have a, a child, let's say you have the, your first child, uh, you will receive some uh, income from some uh, benefit from the government. Uh, and it doesn't matter if you uh, are unemployed or if you're a billionaire, everybody received the same amount. Okay, so that's simple. Uh, honestly, I forgot the amount. It's a few hundred euros uh, at birth. And then it's something like, I think, 70 euros per month for your first child. So this would be around um, six or yeah, 600 RMB five, 600 RMB per month uh, for your first child. And again, it is uh, it doesn't matter what your income is. Everybody receives the same amount. Okay, simple, but uh, if you give money to uh, the, uh, the CEO of uh, LVMH, uh, not quite useful, right? So that's a problem. Then you have the means-tested benefits. So the means-tested benefit, they are benefits that are only paid to those uh, whose income or wealth is often income, but sometimes wealth is also taken into account, falls below some minimum, okay? So if you are too rich or if your partner is too rich, because this might, uh, this really considers your household, not only you, but also your, your wife or your husband. If your family essentially has enough uh, income or income enough wealth, then you would not receive the means tested uh, benefit. Okay, what's uh, the main advantage? Well, that we can reverse uh, the advantage and inconvenient of uh, universal benefit. Uh, the main advantage is that you only target those in need. If people have enough income to be, uh, let's say, independent financially, 
you, you don't give them benefits. So it's a, uh, it's a, a smarter uh, allocation of public funds. But of course, it's more complicated. It's more complicated because you need to collect a lot of information from people about their wealth, uh, their income, about their uh, family situation, whether they have dependents. Uh, it's, it's really complicated and you have to make sure that they don't uh, lie, that they report truthfully uh, their, uh, their income and their wealth. Uh, so it's way, way more complicated to, to, to implement. And this can lead to something that we call the poverty trap, but uh, you should not uh, talk about this in AS because the poverty trap is uh, usually something we uh, discuss in A2. Uh, if you want to uh, elaborate on the poverty trap, then um, that's up to you. But usually I just uh, keep, I save this concept for A2. So I just focus in AS uh, about the first point. It's complicated to put in place. Okay. Then uh, if you look at the, um, the document that I shared on the website, I shared one, uh, it's actually a, a web page that I found and I found it very useful. It really helped me to uh, understand the, the benefits in the UK. So let's, let me open it. Yeah. So it's just called yeah, Understanding Benefits in the UK, The Basics Explained. And to me, this was a great website. Uh, so what you can do as a class activity, if you want, you can uh, print this uh, document to, to them and you have like uh, yeah, the most common benefits in the UK. So you have the name and you have basically a, an uh, explanation of uh, what it is, who receives it. Uh, you have examples uh, and then what you can ask your students. So you could assign, let's say, one benefit to um, each student. Or, uh, or each group of students, okay? So you have like the universal credit, the job seekers allowance, uh, well, the ESA, pension credit, housing benefits, blah, blah, blah. You have a, about, about eight or 10 uh, various uh, benefits in the UK. Uh, and then what you can do with your students is essentially to discuss, all right, is this universal or is this means tested? Uh, I, I think if, uh, all these benefits are uh, in cash benefits. I, I don't think there is any in-kind benefit. So it's just always money, okay? It's a monetary benefit. But some of them are means-tested and some of them are universal. And it's, it would be very interesting to uh, just look at each of them and to discuss, all right, uh, is this something that everybody receives regardless of their income or wealth? Or is this something that is only targeted at those on low income, okay? So you see, for example, this one, I don't, don't even know which the CARES allowance, you see that there is one condition, your earnings uh, are less than 128 pounds uh, a week. Uh, so that's definitely means tested, okay? Uh, there are others, uh, da, 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 da. Okay, this one, it's a non-means-tested benefit. Okay, so here you have the solution. <laughs> so you see the, 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 the attendance allowance, uh, it would be a universal benefit. So I think it's a, it's a great website uh, and a very clear, a very good illustration. So I wanted to share it with you uh, because it really helped me. And I used it in my class last year when I taught this part of the uh, AS uh, syllabus and uh, it proved very useful and it's very practical. And it's important in essays if your students want to gain some application marks, if they want to give examples, it would be uh, very interesting for them to use uh, like specific examples of uh, benefits in the UK. And then what I did in my uh, PPT, I just uh, created this uh, table uh, and I went a bit uh, further. I, I even distinguish in cash and in kind benefit because the um, the, 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 the website I showed you focuses on monetary benefit, okay? So you have here the main examples. I'm not gonna explain each of them uh, because you have the document uh, to uh, understand what this is about. Uh, but basically, yes, in the UK, uh, this, yeah, this is an example of, of benefits in the UK. Uh, these are the ones that are universal, non-means tested. And these are the ones that are uh, means tested. Oh, yeah, means tested. All right. Uh, and there are also uh, in kind uh, benefit. So for the in kind benefit, I, do, I did not specifically focus on the case uh, of the UK. 
but these are the ones that I ident identify. Uh, public education, uh, if you have free public education, uh, it's uh, actually uh, an in-kind benefit. It's the government that essentially uh, provide a, 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 a service to the population. You receive a, a benefit, so you can call that government provision. Yes, it is government provision, definitely. You provide a service or public health care. Public health care is government provision, but you can also regard it as an in-kind benefit if it is free, of course. If it is free. If it is free, it is the, the uh, uh, benefit in the form of a, a service. You have like free education, you have uh, free uh, health care, and you don't have to do anything in return to benefit from that, at least not to benefit directly from uh, the service uh, that you, uh, you benefit from. Could be uh, Medicare in the United States uh, for uh, people, uh, for, 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 for public health care for all the people. Could be veterans benefits. You know that veterans uh, have all forms of uh, in-kind benefits uh, as well. They can have a uh, uh, same thing, a uh, free education uh, for, they can have a uh, discounts on the tuition fees or so things like that. So there are plenty of in-kind benefits for veterans and means tested. You would have a, a Medicaid in the United States for those on low incomes uh, who can again benefit from uh, uh, health care. Uh, and then you have other example, housing assistance. Uh, so this would be in-kind benefits, uh, not necessarily in the UK, but for AS, it's okay to focus on in-cash benefits, okay, monetary benefits. So if you want to delete the last row so you can focus on the monetary benefits, it's fine, okay, it's, it's fine. I just wanted to go one step further and just acknowledge that, yes, apart from monetary benefits, you can also find in-kind benefits. Okay, questions? No questions? Okay. So which country is that? Look at that picture. Which country is it? You better know, or I'm going to be very upset. Who made those beautiful tanks? <laughs> yes, this is France. These are the Champs-Elysees big avenue in uh, in paris and this there is we don't see it but there is the uh, arc de triomphe you know like the big building uh, in the background and uh, this is actually well that's uh, on the national day on uh, july uh, 14th and of course you have like a military uh, parade uh why did i use this example uh because this is national defense and national defense is a service that is provided by the government. Why is this provided by the government? Because it is a public good and uh, private businesses would have no incentives to uh, produce uh, public goods. Okay, so what do we call government provision? It's simply a situation in which the government directly provides <laughs> goods and services. So provides means produces, okay, directly produces or is responsible for the production uh, or finances the production, doesn't really matter of uh, certain goods and services. Yes, uh, often, not always, but usually they are provided for free and financed through the tax system, okay? So you don't directly pay for national defense. Of course, you pay uh, for it indirectly through taxes, same thing for public education, for public health care, but you do not directly from, for your pay for your own consumption. That's what I mean. So they are often provided for free, yes. And again, when you think about it, for the exact same reason as uh, what I mentioned before, uh, government provision uh, usually decreases inequality uh, in the sense that, again, who pays, who, who pays uh, the most for those goods provided by the government? Well, those who pay the most taxes, okay? And who pays most taxes? Those who have a high uh, income or high wealth because they pay a lot of direct and indirect taxes. So if you assume, because, and it's often true, if you assume that everyone in the population equally consumes uh, goods provided by the government, like national defense, 
can we say that uh, something that is much richer than I am uh, consumes more national defense than, than I do? Not really. Everybody consumes the same level of national defense. Okay. But someone who's very rich will pay more taxes. Okay. So that's why we, we can argue that government provision uh, uh, actually reduces inequality. Uh, yeah, why do governments do that? Well, most most uh, one reason uh, is to say that that's because we uh, believe that there are some essential goods and services such as healthcare or education that uh, everyone should uh, be able to access. Everyone should be able to uh, consume or to access to a sufficient level of education and to have access to basic health care, regardless of their income. So it's not really about uh, efficiency here. It's more about, uh, about fairness and about values. What do we consider important? We consider that it is important that everybody has basic education and health care. So the only way we can do this is just to provide it for free, okay, and to finance it through the tax system. So that's the main motive for government pr for, for provision. Of course, uh, there are also a problem of uh, efficiency. Uh, there might be some goods that will not be provided by private businesses, important products that will not be provided by private businesses because they are, for example, non-excludable. And therefore, they would be uh, the problem of uh, free riding. And in this case, uh, firms would not be able to charge a price for those products so it is up to the government to produce them. So in this case, it's a problem of efficiency. For some products, the market fails. So one solution is just for the government to provide these products uh, itself. Yes. Uh, so what problems? Uh, there are some limitations uh, that are associated with government provision. Of course, if we want to provide public, uh, goods and services, if the government wants to provide goods and services, it needs to be able to finance them. So it needs to collect taxes. And collecting taxes is costly, of course. It's not free, it's costly. And it can create inefficiencies. Uh, it's a bit early to talk about the deadway losses of taxation. Uh, but you, if you can still refer to uh, what we um, studied before when we talked about taxes and subsidies, if you introduce a tax in the market, this is going to reduce the equilibrium quantity. There will be a higher price and a lower quantity. And uh, again, it's a bit early to talk about deadweight losses, but you can just tell the students that this will introduce some distortions into the market and this will have negative consequences. Okay, try to explain it uh, without using the word deadweight loss. Okay, so yes, taxes, they create distortions in the market. Uh, they can uh, uh, direct taxes, can lead to tax avoidance, can lead to um, tax evasion. Uh, it can uh, undermine the trickle down uh, economics. So yeah, uh, collecting taxes is not something that is uh, easy, free, and does not have any negative consequences on the economy. So this is something we have to uh, uh, consider. There is um, another problem, which is, uh, uh, something that is quite easy to understand. Uh, when people don't pay for something, uh, they, don't re they are not fully aware of the cost of uh, producing the good or service they benefit from. Uh, let me just uh, give you an example that to illustrate it. So in France, again, sorry, <laughs> uh, you know that uh, public health care is uh, free. If you walk into a public hospital, uh, everything is free. Like uh, entirely, um, I have I have never paid uh, one cent in a public hospital. Uh, for, so, for example, if you go to the emergencies, uh, you will never pay anything. Okay. What's the problem? The problem is that uh, people just go there uh, too often. Okay. Oh, I have a headache. I will just go to the emergency room. It's free. It's quick. I will get medications, and I can then I can go home. Uh, it's free uh, for you. It's not free for society, okay? Because uh, since you have like a lot of people going to the ER uh, just for headaches, you need to hire many doctors. You need to uh, build more hospitals uh, to uh, buy more like, very expensive medical equipment. So it's very costly for um, uh, the entire collectivity. 
which means that we have to, fi to finance that somehow, which means that overall people will have to pay more taxes, okay? So it's actually a problem of negative externality. You only care about yourself. I have a headache. I want to uh, get uh, medications. So I, I go to the ER because it's free. But you don't realize that uh, if you do that, you contribute to uh, generate higher taxes for everyone else. <laughs> because if everybody has the same uh, behavior as you, everybody goes to the ER, uh, we need more hospitals, more equipment. And at the end of the day, the overall tax burden increases for everyone. Uh, it's a problem of a uh, common resource. In this case, it's a problem that is known as the tragedy of the commons, where you do not take into account the negative consequences of your actions on other people. Okay, so when something is provided for free, uh, you abuse it, basically. You, you, you just don't care about the whether, how much it costs to produce. Of course, if, you, uh, if the government provides a, a product, it's uh, going to be a public monopoly, or it's likely to be a public monopoly. Uh, and again, we have not yet studied uh, the negative consequences of a monopoly. This is a part of the A2 syllabus, but you can just give the basic intuition. If you only have one uh, public company uh, producing a certain good or service, it doesn't face any competition. And therefore, it might be quite inefficient produced at the high uh, cost or uh, uh, yeah, pr produced at a higher than necessary cost of production, or it might not sufficiently invest in research and development to innovate. Because again, we don't face any competition. So why should we bother uh, investing to improve the quality of our product? Why should we bother investing to improve the efficiency of our production? A process because we don't face any competition. So that's one problem. And uh, of course, there might be a problem of information. Uh, how much to produce? How much national defense to produce? How much public health care to produce? How much public education to produce? Uh, in a private, uh, if uh, education if uh, was uh, produced only by uh, private schools, for example, uh, you would have a typical uh, supply and demand uh, market and you would have an equilibrium price and okay the optimal quantity would be easy to determine but if you provide public education for free uh, so that's essentially mean that uh, uh, how, basically my point is how do you know how much to produce because there is basically no market in this case if you provide public education on public health care for free there is no market for uh, public education because there is no price uh, no market price. So you might either not uh, spend enough on the construction or on the provision of uh, education, or on the other end, you might spend too much. Difficult to tell. Uh, so, and that's one advantage of the price mechanism. The price mechanism, when there is no market failure, will uh, automatically lead to the efficient quantity of resources, we will produce the best quantity. Again, if there is no market failure, uh, but if there is no market because the government provides a good or service for free, we might not be able to identify the optimal level of provision. Okay, and that's already it for uh, government provision. Questions before we uh, look at the last part? Okay. All right. So yeah, public private because uh, nationalization, privatization is just going public for, from, from public to private or from private to public. Okay. So privatization, you go from a public to private. Essentially you move uh, the ownership. There is a change of ownership from the public sector to the private sector and uh, nationalization. There is a change of ownership from the private sector to the public sector. That's it. Uh, again, uh, that's one occasion to emphasize that your students should use British English. Uh, so privatization and nationalization should be written with an S rather than with a, a Z, right? Just uh, this is a British curriculum. So let's stick to a, a British English uh, in terms of the spelling. Okay, so nationalization, yes, that's a process. And you see that most of my definitions, and I really uh, 
perhaps I've already said it, but I want to repeat it because to me that's very important. Most of my definitions, maybe not all, but really most of them, they always start by uh, the key word that I want to define, then is, and then always a noun, okay? Is the process, a situation, blah, blah, blah. Uh, to me, that's a very uh, good way to start a definition. If you force yourself to start with, with a noun, this is usually a... Uh, yeah, just a good start <laughs> to, to write uh, a fine definition. So it's the process of taking privately controlled companies, industries, or assets, yes, or assets in general, and putting them under the ownership and control of the government. Right. It's a bit long. There could be shorter definitions, but I like it because it's clear and comprehensive. So these are examples of things that have been uh, nationalized in some countries through um, history, it could be banks, could be telecommunication companies, utility companies, that's uh, because they are natural monopolies, uh, transport infrastructures, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I will give some examples later. Okay. Uh, why? Why do we nationalize? What's the main uh, reason? What's the main advantage? Well, sometimes uh, it's just better to have one uh, firm uh, producing for the entire market than having many small firms uh, dividing the market or like competing within the market. Uh, and this is because there are some industries in which there are very substantial economies of scale. Uh, so again, this is not something that we have yet uh, taught in AS, so be careful, just, uh, just give them the basic intuition. You can just tell them that uh, so economies of scale is when uh, the more you produce, uh, the lower your per unit cost, okay? Basically, it's cheaper to produce one unit on average if you produce a lot than if you produce a, a small amount. Just try to use simple words to explain it. And so because of that, uh, if, if you can have a much lower cost of production or average cost of production, if you produce a very large quantity, it actually makes more sense to have one single firm to, that produces for everyone. But the problem is that if you have a private monopoly, if you have one single private firm that produces for everyone, uh, it's actually not a very good idea because if you have a single private monopolist that wants to maximize its profit, it, it might charge a, a very high price, okay? Because it has a very strong market power. It is the only firm within the industry. So it's actually better to have one single public monopolist, uh, which will have a very strong market power but uh, which, is, which is not going to take advantage of that power, which is not going to use this power to charge a very high price. Okay, so that's the, uh, the argument. Could be um, to correct market failures and defend the public interest. Could be, uh, of course, we nationalize, uh, for example, because uh, we believe that uh, private firms, they produce too many demerit goods. Uh, so we nationalize uh, private companies uh, that because they, we feel like they don't do a good job, essentially, we say, okay, you guys, you produce too many uh, demerit goods. So I'm taking over your business. I'm nationalizing your businesses and I will produce the right quantity of demerit goods. Could be same thing with merit goods. Okay, some uh, uh, companies producing merit goods, perhaps they do not do a good job in the sense that they charge a price that is too high. Uh, and at the end of the day, the quantity of married goods is insufficient in the private sector. So the government nationalizes uh, and to produce more, essentially, to produce a larger quantity of, um, of, uh, of uh, married goods. Could be abuses of a dominant position. There is a private firm that just charges a price that is too high. And this leads to an under provision, essentially. There are not enough uh, consumers able to consume the product. So the government can say, right, I'm nationalizing this, uh, this business and uh, I uh, will set a price that is uh, lower. So more people are able to afford this product. And uh, this is sometimes, and uh, we had the great examples with um, the COVID-19 uh, crisis. This can be one way to protect uh, companies that are considered um, strategic for, for the country. Sometimes they are... Uh, uh, important companies, um, strategically important companies that are about to go bankrupt. And essentially, we can't really afford to uh, uh, allow those companies to go bankrupt. Uh, so we can simply save them. And one way to save a private company uh, which is in trouble is to nationalize it. So we have, we have had examples of banks 
whenever there is a financial crisis in some countries governments have uh, nationalized banks in order to save them because they were afraid of the consequences if the banks uh, went uh, bankrupt uh, or in the in some countries uh, after covid-19 the governments have nationalized airlines uh, which country is it sorry i think i forgot um, let's let's check which country has nationalized its main airline because of covid i forgot let's see if i can find it india maybe Am I going to find it? Why do I only find this? Uh, well, maybe you can look into it. I, I forgot. Is this India? I don't remember. All right. Sorry, guys. I don't remember which country nationalized. Maybe there are several. There is at least one. There is at least one. Decided to nationalize. I don't know if it's the largest, maybe the second largest airline. Uh, simply because uh, because of COVID, this airline was uh, in, in trouble, and uh, the government could not really afford having this uh, important business in terms of employment, in terms of uh, uh, again uh, independence. Uh, it's uh, can be considered uh, air transportation can be considered a um, uh, strategic industry. So the government just said, "All right, you are in trouble." Uh, we uh, will save you, we nationalize you, so uh, you can uh, continue to operate, essentially. But there are some problems. So for just like uh, in the case of government provision, because of course, when we nationalize, uh, usually what we do then is to produce. Uh, so uh, if you want, the nationalization comes uh, before government provision. So we nationalize and then there is a public company or there is an asset or owned by the government and there is some government provision going on, okay? Uh, so we have the same problem as before. Uh, there is no, uh, there, not necessarily because it's possible that the public company um, competes with uh, private companies, okay? Uh, you could look at uh, uh, healthcare, for example. In most countries, you have public hospitals and you also have private hospitals. Um, so in this case, there is some competition between the public sector and the private sector, okay? But assuming, assuming there is, uh, no competition that there is one single public company operating in an industry like uh, uh, to produce electricity to produce uh, you know, for railway transportation or for airlines for example then this uh, absence of competitive pressure is going to uh, lead to what we call x inefficiencies but again x inefficiency is something we usually learn in a2 so you can just uh, explain it with simple words say uh, that in that case, we don't face much competition, so we don't have a strong incentive to keep costs as low as possible. And just like I, men I mentioned earlier, why should we bother innovating? Why should we invest uh, a lot of money in R&D to improve the quality of our product, to have new features, or to make our production process more efficient if we don't face any competition? Anyway. Italy. Aha. Uh -huh. Is this Italy who nationalized the... Can I open it without the VPN? Uh, it seems like, no, I think you, I need my VPN <laughs> to open it. So Alitalia nationalized by Italy. Okay, I'll look into it. Thank you, Metro. So yeah, that's one illustration of how nationalization can be used to save uh, strategic industries that are in trouble. All right. So yeah, we still have a disadvantage of. Uh... All right. Thank you, Mitchell. Another disadvantage of nationalization is that uh, when you have uh, a public company, decisions might be driven by political interests rather than by economic uh, reason, 
Okay, so basically we make decisions uh, uh, and we care about uh, the political uh, implications and we might not really care or we might not only focus on the economic implications. So, which means that uh, sometimes the decision to nationalize a company is just one way to gain uh, political support from the population, uh, even if it's actually um, a bad economic decision. Example, that's not a real life example, it's just a story. Let's say that there is a very large company that hires uh, thousands of people in a country. And it is about to go bankrupt because it produces something that is a bit uh, outdated, or obsolete. Okay, so basically, this is a, it operates in an industry that is dying, that is shrinking. So it struggles, or maybe it is, uh, it, it is uh, in trouble because it faces the competition of uh, foreign businesses that, are, that can produce at a lower cost or that can produce at a higher quality. All right. So basically, there is a large company that is in trouble. And uh, economically speaking, uh, it would make sense that, it, that this company goes bankrupt. Okay. If nobody wants their product anymore, if, or if a foreign competition is just uh, stronger, okay. It's uh, tough, but that's just uh, how competition works. But uh, the government might uh, feel like, hmm, uh, if uh, this company goes bankrupt, we're going to end up with uh, thousands, tens of, tens of thousands of people who are going to become unemployed. Hmm, that doesn't really look good, right? If I want to be reelected next year, uh, I, might, uh, I might actually be in trouble for that. So I could just say, don't worry. Uh, uh, we will uh, nationalize your company um, so you can continue and we will, uh, we will preserve all jobs. Uh, and of course, economically speaking, it doesn't make much sense. But politically, uh, that's one way to uh, preserve uh, jobs and, and make sure that your rate of unemployment uh, does not uh, go up next month. So that's one possible problem with nationalization. There is always a combination of uh, political and economic uh, motives. And finally, again, if you have one single, uh, in the event, if there is one single uh, public company, uh, first, there is not much diversity. <laughs> There's not much product diversity. That's one problem with monopolies. You have one single seller. And again, if there is a, this single seller might, not always, but might offer a product of low quality because again, there is no competition. Competition can be uh, or can encourage businesses to provide the highest possible quality. Uh, if there is no competition, again, why should you care about the quality of your product? Especially if you are the only one, people don't have the choice. They have to buy from you. So even if your product is not great, uh, they will buy from you, especially if you produce something uh, that is a necessity, like utilities. All right, privatization is the other way around. Uh, okay, so narrowly speaking, uh, privatization, we also call that sometimes denationalization, but that's a bit weird, so just use privatization. So it's the act of selling companies or assets that were owned and controlled by the government. So they become privately owned and controlled. Okay, so it's basically a change of ownership from the public sector to the private sector. Yes, it is as simple as that. Uh, all right, so there, there are several ways the government can do that. It's not very important. I don't think I ever saw any question about how we actually do it. Uh, and, and I don't think there are many uh, MCQs or uh, data responses or essays where students might be ex expected to explain how governments actually do that. But if, if you want to explain it briefly, why not? So yeah, this could simply be offering shares to the public. Okay, so there is a private public limited company and the government just uh, will sell shares until uh, overall it, it, uh, it owns less than 50% uh, of the the overall share, so it effectively lose uh, control of, uh, of this uh, company. Uh, could be um, management and worker buyouts. 
Uh, so this could be a situation in which uh, those who work for the company, they again, they actually uh, purchase the company to take control of, of, uh, of the company. Uh, or it could be, again, the, the direct sale to new owners. There is, let's say, a private business who say, yes, I'm interested. Uh, this is a public company. You are selling it. Okay, I'll buy it. Could be something like that. So there are several uh, mechanisms that uh, can be used by a government to privatize a, an asset. Uh, but again, I, I feel like this is not extremely uh, important for the yes syllabus. Or could be, sorry, I forgot this one, could be a partial sale uh, with the government retaining some share in the new business. Uh, so this is uh, the same as uh, the first point. Uh, but in the first point, I, I guess that I meant that uh, all shares <laughs> go uh, to the private sector. Uh, and uh, the last point would be uh, we sell some shares to the private sector enough to so, so the company is now owned and controlled, uh, um, that the majority of the company is owned and controlled by the private sector, but the government can keep some influence by retaining some shares in the business. So for example, in France, again, <laughs> the national railway company, the SNCF, is partially owned by the government. Okay, so some of it is owned by the government, some of it is owned by, uh, by the private sector. That would be an example. Okay, uh, what's good? What's good about privatization? What do, uh, why do governments privatize some assets? The idea basically is that if you privatize, you will, this will lead to more competition, okay? Uh, you will have more private businesses competing. And therefore, if you have more competition, it is expected to have more efficiency and lower prices for consumers. Again, this is what is expected. It doesn't always take place. But yeah, more competition, more efficiency, lower prices. Again, if you have more competition, you might have um, a greater product diversity. If you have more private businesses um, in this industry, uh, competition can also encourage businesses, private businesses to offer uh, goods of the highest possible quality. So this is something that can be beneficial. <laughs> and of course, this can generate a revenue for the government. If you sell something, you are the government, you sell a public company, you will have uh, some money that's going to flow in. But of course, it's a one shot thing. It's just a one time source of income. Once you have sold it, uh, okay, you will not receive any uh, income from it in the future. So it's a one shot thing. Main disadvantages. Uh, <clears throat> and that's the main problem. Sometimes, again, as I mentioned, if you, if you are in an industry in which there are substantial economies of scale, it's actually much better to have one big firm producing for everyone rather than many smaller competitive firms. So in that case, it might reduce if you privatize and if this leads to having many smaller private businesses supplying a certain market, this can reduce the ability to take advantage of economies of scale. Okay, second big problem, market failures. Yes, if this is a private business, if, if now the market is supplied by private businesses who care about maximizing their profit, uh, then you might end up with market failures. You could have uh, just uh, market powers. You could simply have a public monopoly replaced by a private monopoly. So you privatize and you expect that there will be more competition. But what if, uh, what if, the, the market, uh, what if the private sector is just controlled by, or, or, or let's say what if a private market is controlled by one large firm, private firm, actually uh, you will not have more competition and that actually might make things worse because now this private firm is likely to charge high prices to maximize its profit. So uh, you don't know whether uh, you, you hope there will be more competition, but there is no guarantee that the market will be effectively competitive. Could be that uh, you will have private businesses uh, producing too many demerit goods, possibly, or not providing enough merit goods. Okay, so you basically, you expose your economy to market failures if you privatize. And this can also lead to a higher unemployment. Because again, Private businesses, they want to keep their costs of production as low as possible. They might want to rationalize the production process uh, to reduce the uh, typical X inefficiencies uh, within a public monopoly. And um, as a result, uh, they may, private businesses, they may lay off uh, some uh, workers and this might lead to an increase in uh, unemployment. Okay. 
Finally, I think there are only two uh, more slides and then we will be done. Uh, you could also have a broader uh, definition of what it means to uh, privatize. You could actually stop there. Okay, If you want to stop there, I think it's enough. If you want to go a bit further, I don't think I added the one step further star, but you can go a bit further. You can introduce a privatization in the, with a broader perspective and say that generally speaking, when we talk about private uh, privatization, it's when you increase the scope of the private sector. Okay, because you could say that essentially an economy, a mixed economy, but now all economies are mixed economies. So you could say that, all right, so an economy is a certain percentage of a public sector and a certain percentage of private sector. Broadly speaking, privatization would be that uh, the public sector uh, shrinks and the public sector, sorry. <laughs> it's, it's funny because uh, the, the camera is uh, in, inverts my hands and I'm a bit confused, sorry. <laughs> uh, so privatization, the public sector, <laughs> decreases and the private sector grows okay so that's essentially what privatization is about um so yeah um, one way you can achieve that is also to deregulate to uh, to implement deregulation and you can also contract out some uh, services so these are two things i I remember when I prepared this PPT I really hesitated about mm, should I include it uh, yes or no uh, I decided to include it at the end of the of the day but it's really up to you if you want to skip this uh, it's actually fine okay but let's just say a few brief words about deregulation and contracting out uh, so deregulation it's uh, you uh, you remove rules <laughs> basically you reduce uh, the number of rules, controls, regulations, and laws. So it's a, a bit uh, the same thing. You can just say you remove uh, rules, that's enough, that are imposed by the, uh, the government on a firm or an industry. Okay. And uh, why can, it's not really privatization in itself, but it serves the same purpose, okay? It serves the same purpose to increase competition, to increase efficiency. That's why I put it to, together. There are many examples uh, throughout history uh, in the UK, in, uh, in the USA. So uh, your students are not expected to know them, but you can just give examples of some uh, laws, some acts that were passed, uh, whose uh, objective was to reduce uh, those, the amount of the number of rules that were imposed on businesses. And again, what, uh, what happens when you deregulate you uh, effectively remove or reduce uh, barriers to entry within the market. You make it easier for private businesses to uh, enter a business, or sorry, to enter a market or an industry that was initially uh, protected uh, by, or that was initially controlled by the public sector. Okay, uh, so it could be something, uh, yeah. So that's essentially what this is, what deregulation is. And uh, that's one way to increase competition. Uh, so uh, greater efficiency, lower prices, higher quality, blah, blah, blah. That's exactly the same, the same idea over there. Uh, and uh, another way in which the government can uh, uh, implement a, a form or broader form of, uh, of a privatization is to use, uh, co uh, to contract out or to outsource, which is simply a situation where the government just uh, uh, hires or just basically gives uh, a private firm the responsibility to produce something, okay, to run a public service. It could be education, healthcare, waste disposal. Uh, yeah, so contracting out the process of awarding contracts to private companies to run public services, okay? So the, it's, not, it's not a public company. The government just say, all right, there is uh, something we have to do. We have to take care of uh, waste. So we need someone to do this. Uh, no, we, we're not going to do it ourselves. We're going to pay a private company to do it. Okay. So again, that's one way you can rely on the private sector uh, to uh, and, and benefit from all the advantages that are associated with private sector uh, production. Okay. Yeah. All right. And I think that's about it. So you know now now that I uh, now that I do it again because I have not yet taught this to my AS students. 
I, I, I think that this year, I, I, I don't think I will talk about these two last slides this year. I think I will stop there because it is a bit redundant. And I, I, I don't really remember many questions in AS about uh, contracting out and deregulation. So I will most likely stop there with the main advantages and main disadvantages of privatization because these two final slides, they might be a bit confusing to some students. So yeah, I would actually advise you not to go through them and simply to stop here. I think the main ideas are there. It's definitely enough to answer all MCQs or to answer uh, uh, all uh, essay questions and data responses that might uh, be about privatization. But if you are, if you want to go one step further, fine, you can talk about uh, deregulation and contracting out. I'm done. So uh, what do we have? Uh, so same thing there. So the summary will be there soon. Uh, you have uh, definitions, not that many. This is the list of uh, definitions that uh, are about this topic. Uh, concept cars. So what do we have to draw here? We have to draw, let me check, a frog and a caterpillar. Okay. And uh, also the essay questions. These are the essay questions about uh, price control, uh, direct provision, nationalization, uh, cost benefit analysis. Actually, I don't really know why it's there. Should not be there, sorry. Cost benefit analysis, that's uh, A2. Uh, you should remove it. Okay, sorry. And uh, yeah, and you have this document, understanding the benefits in the UK. And the summary is almost done. I just need to add a few things. Uh, it's probably going to be just two pages. I think two pages should be enough. So I've already summarized benefits. I just need to uh, summarize the rest, but that should only take uh, one page. So overall two pages should be enough to summarize everything there is to know about this other policy instrument. And I am done. Hey, I think that's the first time I finish in advance. <laughs> Any questions? So we have covered the entire AS micro syllabus in uh, seven weeks. So uh, about 14 hours, a bit more, because sometimes my workshops were much longer. But yeah, 14 hours, maybe 15, maybe more. But you have, uh, now you should have everything there is to know uh, about that part of the syllabus. Just to give you an idea of my own pace, uh, even though it's a bit uh, hard to compare because uh, I started from chapter from unit two because I co-teach AS. Uh, but uh, last year, for example, I finished uh, microeconomics in, in November. Something like uh, yeah, mid-November around the 10 or 15th of November. Um, so yeah, that's, it's actually quite short. I find it quite short. Macroeconomics is uh, much longer, uh, more advanced too. I, I feel like there are some topics that are a bit more tricky, but microeconomics uh, for AS, Usually, most of the topics are relatively straightforward. So, same thing this year. I will finish. I will finish it probably in November, mid-November. So then I will definitely have enough time to cover macroeconomics. My objective this year is basically to finish the syllabus around uh, March. So then we have basically two months to uh, review and before uh, before paper paper two. No questions. All right, then thank you very much for joining me tonight. Uh, this was our last AS workshop. Of course, uh, we will continue with A2 workshops uh, because the, uh, 
the A2 microeconomics syllabus is longer. So I will still need uh, maybe five or six weeks to uh, cover the entire A2 syllabus. So we can meet next uh, Tuesday uh, to uh, talk about oligopoly. That's what we will do next week. Uh, but for AS, for now, this is over. It's likely that I will uh, schedule macroeconomics workshops for AS, uh, but uh, later and not on a regular basis. So please uh, keep an eye on the WeChat group uh, for um, information that I will share uh, in a few weeks or in a few months. All right, thanks again. Uh, I hope you uh, overall enjoyed these uh, workshops. I hope you um, all the resources uh, that I have shared with you will be useful to you, will be useful to your uh, students. Uh, make sure you use the Joker website, okay, for MCQs. That's also something that is uh, extremely valuable and that uh, complements uh, the PPTs and all the other uh, documents. I use, of course, I use it a lot and it's proven very, very useful. Um, and uh, if you have any uh, questions, anything I can uh, help you with uh, in the future, well, feel free to uh, send me a message and I will always be happy to uh, assist you if I can. All right, have a nice evening, everyone. And uh, well, see you soon. Bye-bye.